real pleasure to introduce Father Andrew Pinsent to this audience. Let me tell you something about Father Andrew. So he's at present research director of the Jan Ramsey Center for Science and Religion at Oxford University. He's also a research fellow of Harry Manchester College and he's a member of the Faculty of Theology and Religion at Oxford. And uh, regarding his background, he's a physicist, he has a doctorate in particle physics from Oxford. I mean, the dissertation title is really nice, wonderful. <laughs> Study of leptonic decay channels at the Z0 resonance peak. <laughs> and uh, he has also a degree in theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome and a doctorate in philosophy from St. Louis University. Um, he's an expert in the spiritual anthropology of Thomas Aquinas. His most recent book is The Second Person Perspective in Aquinas' Ethics, Virtues and Gifts. And uh, he has published many articles in, in physics. He's named author on 31 papers of the Delphi experiment at CERN in Geneva and he's also a, mem a member of the United Kingdom Institute of Physics. Um, but uh, I must confess here that uh, reading his resume, his CV, I was a little bit surprised when I saw that he worked some years ago uh, in Itautec Filco. So this is a company of electronics, Brazilian company as a business consultant and also in the European headquarters in Lisbon and in the United Kingdom as a director of the consultancy services. So I think we, must, we can be confident that he's a very down-to-earth person <laughs> and probably because of that he's really suitable to, to share with us his experiences in, in running the Jan Ramsey Center for Science and Religion. So we'll, he will speak today about science, reason, and faith perspectives at Oxford University. So I think it's time now to listen to Father Andrew. Without further ado, thank you, thank you Father thank Andrew. You. Thank you, Father Xavier. I wasn't quite sure why you'd invited me to speak, and um, I'm sure you're interested in our research, but uh, I'm also pretty certain that your interest is in the success of your group working in the science reason and faith at the University of Navarre. And talking to quite a few of you, I also know that you're interested in applying for grants um, from various people. So, so I'm, I'm talking a little bit as, a, as an academic, but also as a businessman, okay? Because we all have to survive. So um, <clears throat> for this reason, I've had this presentation, assumed my task today is to share experience and insights um, from the work of the Ian Ramsey Center with a view to helping you succeed because I think that everyone's interested in success. Um, and I'll mention briefly some of my own research, mainly on the philosophy of the person. Happy to talk more about these issues at the end, <coughs> if you wish. Okay, so um, the Ian Ramsey Center. So we conduct research into religious beliefs and theological concepts in relation to the sciences. Um, we, it's a center that's existed for 30 years and is formerly part of the Faculty of Theology and Religion. Um, I mean, completely part of the Faculty of Theology and Religion. It's actually the main research centre now of the faculty. The current director is the Idrios Chair in Science and Religion. He's quite famous in England. I don't know if you know Professor Alistair McGrath? Okay, so um, in England, he's most famous as being the protagonist of another famous person. You've heard of Richard Dawkins? <laughs> so Richard Dawkins wrote The God Delusion. And um, uh, Alice McGrath wrote The Dawkins Delusion. Okay, so, so in the public arena, uh, he has got, he's quite prominent. So core, core activities of the centre include an annual conference, public lectures, research from externally funded grants. We currently run grants totaling around 5 million euros. Uh, public outreach, including the schools and the media. The, the centre also sponsors the Oxford Forum for Science and Religion which is basically a dinner, presentation, and discussion once a term, for, which includes uh, a lot of senior members of the university. And what we find quite interesting at Oxford is a, a lot of scientists who are interested in um, questions in theology and philosophy. So the, o the head of Oxford Laser Physics comes to these dinners uh, and sometimes gives talks as well. Um, so all kinds of interesting connections at, at a senior level as well. 
Okay. Personal background, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, I worked at the um, large electron-positron collider at CERN in a team building and operating the outer layer of the Delphi detector. We're actually building these, these muon chambers here. Um, I later discovered that people are more interesting than particles, so I went into a different business. Okay. Um, I worked at the large electron-positron collider, um, and I don't know if you follow particle physics at all. It's quite famous... Um, uh, the same tunnel is used for another machine, a Large Hadron Collider, and they recently announced they discovered the God particle, uh, the Higgs boson. And I was asked to give comments about this, you know, and um, I said it's not the God particle, it does give things mass, which is, um, so it's a Catholic particle, really. Okay, so, um, but... Uh, <coughs> Interestingly, just a few months ago, because people were talking about um, faith and science issues, we had a big there was a big conference at CERN, and the Director General of CERN spent three days with philosophers and theologians, uh, and also a lot of the senior scientists. And um, I got to give the opening presentation, which was rather fun. Um, but what was, uh, uh, what, was, um, what was interesting was the scientists were very interested in philosophical questions, but they hadn't had much philosophical training. So we spent a day discussing things like what is truth and what is knowledge. And it came, it came home to me then uh, about this division that's gone on between science and the humanities and how serious it is because even our top people in science don't necessarily have much philosophical training. And they want to. And they want to. So perhaps the work of your centre uh, could help uh, in, in the VAR to, to, to improve uh, this situation. Okay, so I now work back at Oxford as research director of the NRAM Centre for Science and Religion. Interestingly, Oxford itself, d d when you look at the architecture, does it remind you of anything? Rome. Rome, yes. Or, well, actually, not so much Rome, maybe. It's but it actually, it's a university, but it looks like something else, doesn't it? <laughs> Churches, college, um, monasteries. So, this whole institution was founded um, by Catholic civilization around the worship of God, the Mass, and so on. And it's still fruitful 750 years later. Okay, so uh, with the remainder of this talk, I want to talk about, very easy, uh, challenges, opportunities, conclusions, and recommendations. So, contemporary challenges. It's very much a personal view, by the way. Do challenge me about what you think the priorities are, but this is, this is how I see it. So, um, when I was back studying philosophy for the, for the priesthood, um, of course, all priests are meant to study two years of philosophy at least, and we, we studied, among many other people, the works of Hume and Kant, uh, among others. And what was interesting was uh, I, I had the conception initially that they were opposed to faith. And I discovered later on it's not, it's not really the issue. The issue is really the division of faith and reason which takes place with the Enlightenment philosophers. Religion within the limits of pure reason. So the separation of faith and reason seems to me to be the big um, intellectual um, movement of the Enlightenment philosophers. And a much more erudite analysis of this was done by Pope Benedict in his address at Regensburg. And he talks about the three stages of the de-Hellenization of Christianity, the separation of faith uh, and, and reason. And more recently, uh, the new atheist movement has sought to put fresh energy into this division of faith and reason, especially in public discourse among recently intelligent non-academics, so journalists, teachers, students, business people, and politicians. This is becoming a serious problem for um, thoughtful Christians in the world. Um, so 25 years ago, when I was a physics student, to be a Christian in, in England was to be regarded as nice but stupid. Um, today, the, it's, it's a bit more hostile, that we are an obstacle for the brave new world. And um, th this is, in the background of this, is the sense that, um, uh, that faith is, is, is against reason. Uh, this is how it's understood increasingly uh, by, people, by members of the public. And of course, it's being division, um, driven by all kinds of books, the God delusion, God is not great, God the failed hypothesis, etc., etc., um, the new atheist movement. And um, it, it's different to atheism 
in uh, almost a slightly old-fashioned sense in Anglo-Saxon countries, but militant atheists tend to make one or both of two claims that moderate atheists do not. The first is religion is demonstrably false or nonsense, and the second is that it's usually always harmful. It's a, defini it's a, um, uh, a definition given by Julian Bergini in a book on atheism in 2003. Interestingly, Christopher Hitchens is one of the people mentioned here who died not long ago. His brother, Peter Hitchens, recovered his Christian faith um, and wrote, and, and actually is now a prominent journalist in England. And uh, his, his son is at Oxford and has become a Catholic. So I thought you might be interested in that. <laughs> of course, this is not just an Anglo-Saxon problem. So when preparing this talk, I said, well, I wondered, has, has all this stuff been translated into Spanish or Portuguese? Yes. Of course, and I'm sure you're familiar with some of these, these books, uh, and maybe your students are. With New Atheism, of course, it's not actually particularly new. There's, um, if you go back 50 or 60 years to the Soviet Union, the arguments were very similar. And in fact, to become a member of the Communist Party from the late 1920s onwards you, in the Soviet Union, you had to join the League of the Militant Godless. You had to join the League of Milton Godless. And that, of course, gave you access to power and prestige and money and so on in, in that society. This is one of their magazines. It shows uh, Jesus being thrown out of a wheelbarrow while they build the brave new world. I believe this, the, the, the same, sometimes you get the same kind of sentiments in Spain, I'm sure. Uh, and it really was militant. So this is the largest Orthodox church in the world being dynamited uh, in 1931. It was rebuilt in the year 2000. And of course here in the heart of Europe, uh, in 1976 in Albania, part of the constitution, part of the constitution of Albania was the state recognizes no religion and supports and carries out atheistic propaganda to implant a scientific materialistic world outlook in people. So why we should be concerned? Well, I think actually everyone should be concerned about this division being developed between faith and reason. I think many thoughtful atheists should be concerned about this division going on between faith and reason. So, uh, it's interesting the parallels of something just happening now in the news, uh, we reported in the news. So, they're there in the French Revolution, 1793, the goddess of reason was being enthroned in Notre Dame. And in that very year, the guillotine went into operation, separating heads from bodies. And now just uh, a few days ago, we see the same kind of movement. I don't like the human head. Why we should be concerned? Another reason is that under the banner, under the banner of science versus faith, um, a lot of other moral issues, uh, a lot of other um, a lot of legislation is being passed that is actually very harmful to our humanity. Um, so when in England we were debating the um, attempt to develop animal-human hybrid embryos, a lot of the rhetoric being used in Parliament um, used this conflict between science and faith as a, a rhetorical tool to help encourage people to support the legislation. There are, of course, many books answering the New Atheists, but they're not so widely read. I mentioned Richard, um, Alistair McGrath's um, The Dawkins Delusion and various other things as well. So uh, the, the, the game is afoot in terms of uh, the debate out there, but these things are not generally quite so widely read. So, so the, here's the perspective of an, out, of an outsider um, looking at the Spanish-speaking world and please correct my misconceptions if I'm wrong about this. Um, by and large, I think the circumstances are a little bit different to the Anglo-Saxon world. And one of the differences is that the first stage of de-Hellenization of Christianity didn't happen in the Spanish-speaking world in the same way, because you didn't have the Reformation. And that began the process of dividing faith and, and, and reason and uh, the break with metaphysics. Interestingly, in the United States, a lot of thoughtful evangelical Christians are now very interested in the work of Thomas Aquinas. Um, and this is a big surprise, but you see they're looking for metaphysics. They want 
um, an ordered foundation to their thinking, particularly in the face of an increasingly hostile secular world. Also, my impression is that difficulties with evolution, which shape, have shaped a lot of the science and religion discussions in the Anglo-Saxon world, uh, are less severe than in some Protestant or Islamic cultures, at least in part because of a, a different kind of metaphysics, a strong commitment to secondary causation, and also due to the allegorical spiritual interpretation of scripture. On the other hand, fierce anti-clerical movements have often co-opted the science versus faith narrative in Spanish-speaking societies. So um, there are battles on of a different kind, often polit more politically oriented. And now at Oxford, we've been doing the work in Latin America for a while, mainly led by my, my colleague Ignacio, and um, one of the aspects of that work was to um, look at um, who's talking to who in the world. And this is a very interesting analysis. It shows email traffic worldwide, um, and, and there's a, there was an analysis of 10 million emails, um, and the, the test was Huntington's theory about civilizations, about whether um, civilizations group together more than geographic locations. And it's interesting, um, by and large, there is, of course, a clumping of different kinds of civilizations. But this is, but this is perhaps a particularly interesting feature of the analysis. Um, this is Latin America. Latin Americans talk to one another a lot, but they don't talk to the rest of the world very much, except through Spain and Portugal. And um, so there's an interesting thing to think about if you're planning projects um, w with um, international funders, um, maybe they should be um, not just um, Spain, but also Spain and Latin America, because you can have to help, to help to act as a bridge um, uh, between Spanish-speaking cultures and, 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 and the rest of the world. At the moment, there just isn't enough communication. Okay, so that's just a bit of background on some of the challenges. And by the way, they're mainly public challenges. In terms of opportunities, <coughs> my perception of the academy is rather different to the perception of what's happening uh, in the public arena. So in the academy, uh, we're in a very a strange situation. I think modernism has given way to postmodernism in, in the academy. Uh, and one example is what's happening in contemporary Anglo-Saxon philosophy. So 50 years ago, it's very strongly influenced by posit positivism, um, would not really consider religious questions very much. And today, there's far more space for broader intellectual exploration. And the analytic philosophy of religion actually draws in a lot of young scholars who are interested in theological problems, but frustrated with old-style modernism of much academic theology. So, um, if you want to have intellectual games with um, the incarnation and the mind-body problem, or, or thinking about the Trinity, or the gifts of the Holy Spirit, um, quite often you'll find that these sorts of things are going on in philosophy faculties more than theology faculties, which I find is a very strange situation today. Um, but these are intellectually fun things to investigate. Uh, and we've got a, a decline of the modernist project. It's like the battlefield... Um, and all the, all the armies have been fighting, and there are lots of fragments left on the field. And, and in some ways, it's quite liberating today. If, you know, you, 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 there are less barriers to exploring um, the ideas that interest us. So the decline of the modernist projects led to fragmentation, also opportunity. I think there's less overt resistance to exploring ideas in natural theology, even from, and even from revealed theology. So I think there's, so there's a change from modernism to postmodernism, but the other thing is um, the, the, a growing realization and a, a growing ability to show the insufficiency of a positivistic world. So we, we've become more adept at using rigorous reason and empirical study to show the insufficiency of positivism, and that there's many different kinds of work in this area, um, work in uh, Gestalt of Perception. Uh, philosophical puzzles like the parable of the garden, which is a big influence on the philosophy of religion in the Anglo-Saxon world, and the irreducibly, irreducibility of the material world to formalism. We've also rediscovered the ancient Aristotelian wisdom about the intellectual virtues. There are many ways in which the mind grasps truth, um, not just through um, um, logical syllogisms. And this has op opened up the way to uh, space for philosophy of religion. 
And in some cases, we, we can explore the neural concomitants and conditions for these operations. So one area that interested me a lot as a physicist um, was uh, is, is work in, in chaotic systems. Um, when I was studying physics as an, as an academic, um, no one really told me about the, the, the limitation of physics. All of physics is built around the study of two-body problems. All of physics. And all, all the philosophy and all the theology influenced by physics has, has been really the study of two-body systems. Because these are the only things we can integrate. And that's, and that's brought a lot of philosophical baggage with it. Because the thing about the Newtonian system, the Newtonian two-body system, is that past, present, and future are, collect are connected formally. Are connected formally. Which has given us, of course, huge predictive power. We know where Jupiter will be in a thousand years' time, for example. Um, but, of course, most interesting systems in nature are not two-body systems. They're three-body and higher. And since the invention of mathematical techniques of analysing these with modern computers, uh, we see different kinds of behaviour and different kinds of metaphysics. Um, so the strange attractors in chaotic systems actually look a bit like Aristotelian causes. So it's like the toolkit for looking at the world, for thinking about the world, philosophically, has, has expanded. And also, as, as, a, as a student in physics, I have to say, I was also very impressed by the beauty of physics and mathematics at a deep level. People often say the world is messy and evil, and that's true. Wherever you get spontaneity and free will, you get messiness and evil in the world. But when you go down into the basement of reality, the deep level stuff, you see amazing beauty. If you've never, if you've never um, looked at YouTube on the Mandelbrot set, just have a, have a, have a, a bit of a, a fun, play with it. It's, um, it can be expanded forever, and it never repeats itself. When I go to schools, I say, this is what God's wallpaper looks like. Okay? Um, but it, it, it's just incredible. You know? there's, there's not a proof there for God's existence, but you feel, heck, there's, there's a sense of awe from it. You know? Now, there's another um, interesting area of work. I mentioned about different ways the mind grasps truth. And what is interesting is sometimes we can now, we can now use some work in neuroscience to begin to um, revalidate these things. So uh, there's a very interesting book, The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World. It was about a philosopher at Oxford who was very interested, why is the brain divided into two parts? Why is the most complicated object in the universe divided into two hemispheres? And it's more than in non-human animals. This is very curious. He discovered it was an unfashionable topic, so he went into medicine, he eventually became a neuroscientist, then he went back to philosophy, and then he wrote this book. And it's, it's, it took 30 years. And uh, it's, it's fascinating. So, um, so it's interesting, if, if you ask someone, this is a, uh, someone to draw a picture of a tree, this is when both hemispheres are operating. But if one is suspended, if one is, is temporarily inhibited, then um, you get only... You, with the left hemisphere, you, get, you don't get a picture of the whole. You just get half. You just get one side, but you don't get a sense of the whole. But if you get the right hemisphere only, you get the sense of the whole, but just a lot of detail. There, there is an asymmetry um, between the two. And it seems that the, the right hemisphere is preferentially, not exclusively, oriented towards um, the perception of the whole. And this is also where the work of metaphor carries on, the work of understanding. And if people ask, what does faith do? Because quite often people say, who've got a, a scientific training, they say, what good is faith? What scientific predictions do you make? What facts does it add to the world? Your faith is useless. Um, well, I say, well, faith doesn't give you facts, about natural facts about the world, but it shapes the grand narrative within which the world is understood. And that's also very important by the way, when I was a teenager, I often wondered why Jesus spoke in parables. Um, because it seemed to be a very long-winded way of making some simple points. Why does he just give us the, the, you know, the propositions? Um, and later on, I understood it's the best way of teaching. And it's good for the right brain hemisphere. <laughs> the word of God. Okay. Um, but here's an interesting comparison about 
how a scientific, how a faith perspective can change the way we're looking at the world. This is this is um, a letter of a, of a very early pope to the Corinthians, Clement the First of the Corinthians. Now, early Christians had a lot of problems to worry about. Um, the first time Christians enter the history books, um, we are being burnt alive in Nero's pleasure gardens. Now, this is not a good situation. Right? Um, but it's interesting, already, early Christians are thinking about the cosmos. This is fascinating. And you talk about the harmony of the cosmos. And here's a modern philosopher looking at the cosmos. This is Simon Blackburn. Talking about it's all accidental. It's all... Um, there's no necessary order there. And it, it, it's, it's not a question of different empirical facts. It's a different perception of the whole. And you can see this, by the way, how faith affects perception uh, in art. So in 1432, this was a vision of happiness in the world. It was a vision of ultimate happiness, symbolic picture of the kingdom of heaven. And see what's happened to art since then. So in 1524, the, 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 the pictures become much smaller. The focus on nature is, 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 is principal. By the late 16th century, the Christian elements are very small. The focus is, is almost entirely on nature. Then by the 19th century, uh, this is the, the height of English landscape painting. Very, very beautiful. But what's gone, of course, there's no saints or sacraments or cross. All that's been pushed away. This is, if God is here, God is only a distant creator. But what happens next? 1890, the last picture of Van Gogh before he commits suicide... The, uh, the road is going nowhere, and the vertical dimension is collapsing. By 1947, some art looks like this. I'm not making a value judgment. I'll leave that for you. But the point I want to make is that the faith perception of the world affects the order we see in nature. And we see other kinds of disorder now developing. Uh, this was London in 2011. So um, I suggest that you know, when people say, what does faith do? Well, because of this new work in Gestalt perception and neuroscience and looking at art and so on, uh, you say, well, it helps to understand the big picture, the context within which facts are understood. It shapes the institutions that are, have a role in intellectual progress, ideas of philosophy, progressive view of time, education, morals, law, society, and hope. I became a priest, by the way, principally um, because I had a calling and to get people to heaven. But to help save, save civilization will be a nice bonus. You know? Um, you know, the call of a, of a Christian is to be, you know, there's a supernatural sense to it, but actually, if one is faithful to it, it should be a blessing for this world as well. It should be a blessing in so many ways. So a possible lesson from art, as the life of faith has been gradually rejected, is our perception of ordered nature gradually breaks down. I speculate, I speculate that ultimately science may not be immune from this decay even while we accumulate new facts. And the situation of science today, again, a very personal perspective, I think we're in a very odd position for science today. We are discovering a lot of new facts. We have new telescopes, new machines, and so on. But it's interesting when you look at a subject like physics. The big insights are now um, 80 to 90 years old. We have far fewer insights today than, than, uh, in, than in the past. And uh, this is quite disturbing for, for some professional physicists today. Uh, and it's, it's not the public perception of what's happening, because it looks very successful. But um, I think there's a loss of insight, a loss of insight. Okay, so, so positivism, uh, we see more clearly the limitations of positivism. I want to say that positivism is ultimately a bit boring. Um, <laughs> Uh, I speculate another a reason for a revival of interest in theological and religious matters is boredom. So if you get rid of God, or God talk, or even a felt absence of God, a God whole, uh, as well as all the interesting problems in revealed theology, what substantive matters are left to talk about? You know? um, so so um, it's interesting, you can see an advanced state of this at Oxford Philosophy Faculty. Oxford Philosophy Faculty more or less got rid of God about 50 years ago. Right? Um, and, and just a few years ago, they ran a conference on the incarnation and the mind-body problem. 
I felt I'd fallen into a parallel universe. I didn't know what, you know, Oxford <laughs> Philosophy Faculty, looking at this, right, okay. But you see, it's, it's intellectually interesting. It's intellectually interesting. And even prominent um, public atheists, you know, in some ways you say that their whole lives will be made a lot more interesting because of God, you know. Um, Professor Richard Dawkins started off studying chickens. Um, and he's become famous because, you know, of God. I know. <laughs> um, it's, it's interesting, this stuff. And it's, it's not uncommon for some atheists to enjoy the intellectual fun. We, we run the In and Conference each year, and um, the variety of backgrounds that people come from is, is, is very broad. And some prominent atheists, in fact, there were two prominent atheists gave plenary presentations at our conference last summer. And they were excellent presentations. And that's what we want to encourage. We want to encourage real dialogue and debate. And it's, intellectually, it's intellectual fun. And atheists can also enjoy it, I think. Okay. So, um, so uh, positivism got boring. So um, theology comes back in. But also, I think there's actually an opportunity today, if you look at the broad picture of Western thought, a, a huge opportunity um, for a new way of understanding the world. So, there's a book by Michael Ruse called Science and Spirituality, and he's very good at pithy, at short explanations of things. But he says, most of Western thought for the last 25 centuries has been dominated by two uh, root metaphors, two foundational metaphors. Um, the, the, the organism or the machine. Aristotelian philosophy was dominated by the organism, by, by, by a biology, and modern philosophy is dominated by the machine. But we've never had a good metaphor for the person. Persons are not, mach are not machines, but not just organisms either. And what I think is one of the interesting developments today in my own research is that I think there's, there's a huge opportunity today to, to explore the philosophy of the person. Um, looking at work in science, informed by philosophy, and also interacting with theology. In fact, if you go back to the history of the term person, persons actually emerged from theology. Uh, there's a very good book by Robert Spayman, Persons, the difference between someone and some thing. And he identifies without theology, we would have no name for what we now call persons. And perhaps without theology, the term person will gradually disappear. I mentioned um, communism earlier. It's interesting how the term person was uh, largely abolished in, in, in discourse in the Soviet Union. People talk about the people collectively, but not persons, not persons. And um, St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, who normally gets there first, um, talks about persons as subsisting relations, among other things. Which incidentally makes me think a lot about physics. Because if you look at um, the deep level structure of matter, um, you, you, if you break matter into smaller and smaller pieces, um, you, um, eventually you get to funny, a funny state where the smallest objects um, that, that make up uh, the protons and the neutrons only exist in relation. So if you pull a, pull a quark away from a proton, um, the force pulling it back gets stronger with distance, not weaker. The, these things only exist uh, in, in, in relation. And, um, but the problem is, persons are not just biological beings with extra bits added on. Persons um, appears to be inherently relational. And uh, this, is, this is where particularly the work on the second person is important. We don't just denote other persons as, as, uh, by third personal terms, but by you. Um, persons who are present to us in some way and whom we wish to address. So St. So Augustine says of God, late how I loved you. He doesn't say there's a person I who's been late in loving another person you. It's, it's, um, uh, there's something different about the second person relationship. And of course this was uh, in, in philosophy, it's Martin Buber who largely uh, initiated the study of these things. What I think is interesting from psychology and, and neuroscience today is that we can begin to put this on an experimental basis. And this is a very interesting work on joint attention. Uh, I'll give you an example here. So here's a, here are two children, both focused on something, but there also uh, there's a sense of union between the two, the two persons. Um, 
uh, through the shared, through the joint attention uh, with one another. It's a shared awareness, a sharing of focus, sharing an attitude towards the thing or event in question. Curiously, we now know there are some human beings who don't have this kind of relationship or, who, or whose relationship is atypical. Uh, and this is the condition we call autistic spectrum disorder. And uh, autistic children don't point the, normally the same way as, uh, as uh, is normal in, in child development and so on. So this is helping us, giving us a means and motive to investigate these things. And I discovered, uh, my, own, my own research, um, some of these ideas were actually there back in Aquinas' ethics in the 13th century. So his virtue ethics is really about coming into joint attention relationship with God. And this is important for Catholic theology. Because one of the biggest problems in Catholic theology in the 20th century was understanding how does the life of nature relate to the life of grace. This is the number one issue in theology in the 20th century. And um, the one way of understanding it now uh, is that grace takes away our spiritual autism. The issue is not the existence of God, but related to God in a particular kind of way, um, which is an I-thou relationship. I think this can actually, there be this, there are many opportunities for future research in this area. Um, and this is one of the fun areas. This is one of the areas where we can use science and philosophy and theology very constructively together. So recently, I, 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 there's a huge fat volume called the Oxford Handbook of Social Neuroscience. And it's over a thousand pages and hundreds of articles. Uh, and there's lots of new empirical data. But it's clear that the people writing it don't know much about virtue ethics. They don't know much about, and they're not talking about persons very much. So here's, a, here's an opportunity for people working in, in, in social neuroscience um, uh, to be informed, and, and some of that research to inform uh, you know, work in philosophy uh, and theology and so on. And um, you know, this is a you know, theology, neuroscience, psychology. And maybe also social cognition animals, and so, so non-personal living beings. Because, um, you see, some, some, some of our um, uh, nearest companions imitate this kind of work. So dogs are particularly good at picking up some of the signals that we use. I also, um, I, uh, I have several nieces, and it's interesting to see how they develop um, their virtues, particularly their virtues of temperance uh, with respect to food and drink. And being a student of Aristotle, I thought, well, maybe they, they, they use practical reason and then by habit they get better and better at choosing what's rational. And this is nonsense. This is not how children acquire temperance. Um, this is how they acquire temperance. So it's normally playing a game. And they're not interested in the food. They're interested in the interaction with the parent. <laughs> So, so is it, uh, by the way, it's very hard. It's, it's one of the problems we have with autistic children is getting them to eat properly. Because the mechanism for, for learning, for acquiring the taste, uh, is not so, so easy to develop. So this everyday aspect of character development is not in Aristotle's account of the virtues. It is in Aquinas. Right? And it offers a prospect for a Copernican revolution of virtue ethics. A switch of emphasis from the first to the second person perspective. This is why I think this is a, a, uh, certainly I wanted to explore over the next few years. Okay, so um, I've given you a very big picture view of what I think are the uh, problems and opportunities uh, in science and religion. Actually, I'm pretty hopeful for the academy. I'm more pessimistic for public understanding. Um, so this is what I want to work on. Uh, and I think in the academy, we actually have the opportunity for a lot of very interesting research in the years ahead. Um, the sense of a division of faith and reason is increasing. It's increasing in discourse among reason reasonably intelligent non-academics. So journalists, teachers, students, business people, politicians. And I, I do a lot of visits to schools and I give talks on faith and science. And sometimes I ask 11-year-olds what is the relationship between science and faith? And they say they are opposed to one another. Yeah? I say that's very interesting. I say, what is science? Don't know. <laughs> what is faith? Don't know that either. <laughs> but they know they're in opposition. So already they're picking up from peers or the media, journalists, whatever, 
the idea that if you're a person of science, you cannot be a person of faith, or vice versa. In academia, actually, uh, the transition to postmodernism, uh, a new awareness of the limitations and perhaps boredom with positivism, and new empirical work offer, I think, many opportunities for future research at the intersection of science, reason, and faith. Like all interdisciplinary work, the challenge is to do, is to do good enough work across different disciplines that doesn't sacrifice depth. Um, and this is always a challenge for my work, a challenge for your work. But if you can get sufficient cross-disciplinary expertise, then, then the research centers can make a significant contribution to academic research and improved public understanding. I'm going to make a surprise, some surprising recommendations. Um, I think you need to be good salespeople. This is a, so I'm going to put my business hat on mentally for a few minutes. Okay. Um, but selling, it's not, it's not a dirty word. St. Paul did it. Um, most people sooner or later are in the business of selling things. If they want money, the opportunity to survive, the chance to do good. Academics, they need to be salespeople. Uh, they need to be good politicians. They need to sell projects to universities, governments, funding agencies. So they invest time and money. My experience, most academics don't have professional sales skills. These skills are like any skills. Um, you need to listen to those who can teach them and invest time and effort in learning them. The most frequent mistakes made in, in selling are to fail to listen to the buyer, whoever the buyer is. It could be just someone accepting an idea. Um, but to fail to listen to the buyer, to find out what the buyer really wants, and to ensure that what is offered will achieve these goals. Selling is actually a second personal activity. It's getting into the, into the needs of the other person. And it's quite hard for us today because we live in a very narcissistic age. And in a narcissistic age, everyone's focused on themselves. Right? So somehow, in this area, you have to sort of get out of that and, and focus on the other person. Um, in the business world, um, this is done... A, a sort of um, a summary for how to do this is something called the sales cycle. So you have, um, this is how you write proposals. So you have aim, requirements, what the buyer wants, but the next step is really important. The management considerations, what the buyer wants in wanting what the buyer wants. So when people buy a computer system, for example, they don't want the computer system, they want something else by means of the computer system. When funding agencies give money for academic projects, normally they have other goals in mind, longer term goals for the academy, for, for success in society, for something. It's normally driven by hope or fear. Um, background, the situation of the buyer, proposal. By the way, in this list, when do you start talking about yourself? How many steps down? How many steps down before you start talking about yourself? Five. That's the next that's a mistake that's often made. People say, I've got a great idea. It's not too soon. Um, benefits, costs, implementation plan, and close. And the benefits have to tie to the manager considerations. So, um, so I, I, I suspect many of you are sooner or later in the business of, of needing these skills. So I thought I'd just mention them uh, slightly. Okay. Nothing succeeds like success, I'm afraid. Sorry, aphorism from business. Life isn't fair, is it? Right? Um, to, to those that have, more shall be given. Money, attention, fame, and so on. For this reason, the most successful centres, the most successful universities generally attract the most funds. We just had um, um, uh, the Research Excellence Framework um, exercise in England, done every five or six years. The most successful universities get the most money. For the next round, you know, it's, it's, it's a virtuous circle. And uh, the challenge is often to get started. Once started, funding can become a virtuous circle, whereby successful projects enable new skills and opportunities. If you're starting from scratch, find, an up, find a partner, find a, uh, an existing grantee, or find some unique benefit you can offer a funding agency. And you need to think about this with regard to communicating to the public. I'll just go on a couple of minutes because we start a bit late. So communicating ideas is analogous to writing proposals. One must get a sense of what the clients want, what the clients want in wanting what they want. Um, people do want to know things, that's natural. 
and they also want to gain some kind of delight or success from what they know, but we're drowning in data. The world is drowning in books. It's drowning in, in, in data all day long. So, and the audience shrinks rapidly as the difficulty of gaining understanding increases. So roughly speaking, the audience size grows, passing from books and articles to popular books and articles to pictures to medium-length videos to short videos. I'm trying to get more, I'm, at the Ramsey Center, we're trying to get more and more work done here, short videos, if we can, which is not easy. At, at, the, at the IRC, we, we spend a considerable time and effort working to improve the quality of audiovisual communication. Um, so I spend some of my time, although I'm interested in philosophy of the person, I do spend some time um, working on design of posters, because I think that's very important. Um, so, but they, they've, got to, they've got to communicate well. And um, I'm sure you understand this at University of Navarre, but it's, it's worth remembering how important this is. Um, these are some of the many projects and, and conferences we've run in Oxford the last few years. And we've also prepared a short video. Can I show the short video? Just very quickly. Right. So, um, get it working. Oh, a bit higher. See if it works. This is our current big project called the Special Divine Action Project. And we've, we've prepared a three minute video to show people what we're doing. Is every thought, is every action in the cosmos only an effect of some other thought? Or some other action in the cosmos? Or is there something more? Is there divine intervention? Is there divine inspiration? One fact is certain. Belief in these special divine actions has had an immense impact on human society and civilization. Such beliefs shape, often decisively, the way we think about the world. What we do in the world. And what we hope for, now and in the future. Human beings have given many names to the various purported effects of special divine action, including grace, inspiration, miracles, and providence. The interpretations of such effects, their possible causes and reasons, are among the most important challenges we face as individual persons and in our societies today. Is special divine action possible? And if so, how would we know? What views are held about the kinds, causes, and implications of such actions? How does purported special divine action fit with our observations and with our philosophical, religious, and scientific worldviews? Are there advantages or disadvantages to holding particular beliefs about these matters? Does science explain or explain away special divine action? Can new research provide insights and metaphors for such action? The exploration of these topics also encourages us to reflect on other major questions in science, philosophy, and theology, such as the meaning of causation, of action and potential, of information and cognition, and of what it means to be a person. Such issues have been examined many times since the development of modern science, but much of what has been written in recent centuries is surprisingly little read today. With the help of new digital humanities technology, the Special Divine Action Project at Oxford University aims to recover the wisdom of the past on these questions and to bring this wisdom into dialogue with contemporary work in science, philosophy, religious studies, and theology. Conferences, courses, competitions, debates, and presentations will stimulate new research. Summaries, videos, and digital tools will provide resources for academics, teachers, students, and the broader public. By enabling access to past wisdom and contemporary research into the issues of special divine action, this project will promote new intellectual engagement with one of the greatest spiritual and intellectual quests of humanity. Just a question for you at the end. Is it much easier to read a paper than to watch a video? Our young people are, are downloading these sorts of things all the time, and, and, and need to be part of that um, part of that input. Okay. So, um, so final remarks. I think there are tremendous opportunities for new interdisciplinary work. 
I think if done well, it could be contributing to healing the cognitive fragmentation and dissonance that I see in many places, as well as helping to slow, slow or reverse the divisions opening up between faith and reason in our world, which are manifested in irrationality and inhumanity. At the work of the Centre Navarre develops, I encourage you also to do what you can to improve public understanding and to dispel misconceptions. And just very briefly at the end, and I've run out a little bit further than I uh, wanted to, but I wanted to conclude, this is a project I did uh, in my own time, it's not a university project, but um, I did it to help uh, schools uh, with, with science and religious questions. So uh, these are new big posters we put in schools. So I gave a talk to, to head teachers in Birmingham uh, three years ago, and they, and they said, we don't have posters, you know. Um, I go to school sometimes, and uh, they say things like, how can you believe in the Big Bang and be a Catholic priest? I say, we invented it. <laughs> <laughs> There's the poster. <laughs> or genetics. <laughs> it's interesting, you see, um, people in academia often know these things, and those are a more complex story than than is generally believed, but they don't know it, and the, pu the public don't know these things. And we need to, be, we need to help them, and help teachers, uh, and there are various other things. You know, the first female professor of mathematics was appointed by a pope in 1750. It's 150 years before the first woman to get a PhD in mathematics in the United States. Well, an interesting story that most people don't know about. <laughs> and a little humor helps. So, um, I mentioned Richard Dawkins at the beginning. And he, um, uh, he ran a, or, or he, he contributed to a campaign on London buses, ran a few years ago. There's probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. Right? So the idea of being an atheism gives you peace and joy. Okay. Not quite sure that works out in practice. Anyway, um, but, but Richard Dawkins was challenged to a debate by the American evangelical philosopher William Lane Craig. Um, and uh, he didn't really want, uh, uh, Richard uh, Dawkins said yes, and then he backed out. And so um, there was an advertisement put out all over the Oxford buses. Um, there's probably no Dawkins. Now stop worrying and enjoy yourself <laughs> at the Sheldonian Theatre. Okay, I'll, I'll finish there and give a bit of time for questions. Thank you very much. I'd like to know about what you said about the public understanding of science and this division in the, in the public to do something about that as well. So I, I would like to know what, what you do. It, you mentioned your work at schools and the posters. Yes. But is the, the Ian Ramsey Centre actually doing something in that respect? What sort of activities or projects you have for? Well, thank you for that question. Um, the answer is we want to do more work. So. Um, I've myself done, done the poster project with uh, a Catholic publisher, but um, uh, my new boss, Alistair McGrath, um, does a lot of work in schools, and we want to increase this in the future. But we're not quite sure ha how to do this. Um, partly, I think, giving talks, of course, um, but also perhaps the way subjects are taught. Um, so when I studied art, I'll give you I, I, uh, here's a fairly easy example. When I studied art at my state school, I learned nothing about um, the religious aspects of art. So, um, and then many years later, I discovered that most of what we call the Western art tradition was um, stimulated by Christianity for a thousand years. So. Um, to give an honest account of, of art and its history, you'd have to you ought to include um, the Christian elements. But it's in, in a secular education, often these things are cut out. Um, and you might say that part of the job we have is to rebalance education so that a, a more sort of comprehensive look includes the, the ways in which faith has been a cause in human affairs. An example is that perhaps with history as well. So history, um, I recently read a book in, in England called Sacred Causes by Michael Burley. He's a professional historian. What was unusual about this book was that he considered um, matters of faith to be important causal factors in human affairs. And it suddenly made me, reading this book, I suddenly realized a lot of history we study is very materialistic. 
So we look at things like tank production or electronics or developments in science. But these are not the only causes in human affairs. So to be a good historian, you have to also consider matters of faith, at least in the secondary sense, of being causes in human affairs. Um, I'm not so sure how you do this with genetics, but of course, uh, apart from the story of Mendel, of course. Um, but of course, but, but there's, a, there's a kind of philosophy here of secondary causation which is important. Um, so if I was t if I was teaching bi biology, I'd want people to know about um, Aquinas's philosophy that God has given His creatures the dignity of being causes, because that gives a very different way of looking at the world than when you if you believe God is the only cause. And a lot of there are now big societies in our, on our planet who think God is the only cause of everything that happens, and they have a very different attitude to science and reason. Ignacio Silva. Andrew, thank you so much. Um, you said that success, nothing succeeds like success, right? And I wonder whether you can say a few extra words on what does success oh, look like today right. in a in a research project because a few years ago it was volumes and books yeah but you hinted it at the fact that today that changed right uh, so just a couple of ideas and that will be great well um, what one brute thank you for that question nothing succeeds like success well you can you can you can complete um, you can analyze that in several ways but one way of measuring it is who's paying the money because um, they will determine partly what success means. So in Britain today, government does want us to produce papers and books, but actually they're also interested in public impact. And so in the research excellence framework exercise, we were, we were asked to account for our public impact, which is not easy in, and sometimes in the humanities. So, um, uh, so, so sometimes, sometimes in part, um, the criteria for success are determined by outsiders. And we have to meet those criteria, um, uh, but also we, we, you know, we have a, we should also be setting our own goals as well. And um, uh, and I would say, the flourish, the full, the complete flourishing of the human person, in nature and grace. That's my that's my criteria for success. You know. It's very encouraging. Uh, how you think big. Uh, you yeah. want to save souls, but if you can save society as a whole, civilization right. right. even well, better. <laughs> well, you see here, well, but um, that may sound crazy, but here we are at the University of Navarre. The University of Navarre is an Opus Dei university. Who founded Opus Dei? Santa Rosa Maria. Santa Rosa Maria. So that's one person. Yeah. One person? That's amazing. And, you know, we work in Argentina with uh, Dr. Varney here. And um, it's... Uh, it's, it's wonderful work we have to do, done, we've done with her. And Australia University, another Opus Dei University. Gosh, that goes back to Jose Maria as well. So you get one person having a huge impact. That's part of the fun of life. There's no limit to what's possible. Um, uh, I'll, I'll tell you something. Um, have you heard of Lady Gaga? <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry for this British export to Spain, right? Okay. Right. But, but Lady Gaga was asked, as uh, she was interviewed by the BBC, and by the way, our young people obviously listen to her, you know, uh, and there are millions of downloads of her records and videos, you know, of her uh, songs and videos. So, she was asked by the, the BBC, what is your philosophy? Right? And she said, I want to teach people that they can be whatever they want to be. They can be whatever they want to be, which sounds ambitious, but I've got a bigger ambition for you, right? Um, the Blessed Virgin Mary. The Blessed Virgin Mary doesn't say, I will be whatever I want to be. She says, I will be with you, Lord, whatever you want me to be. And in achieving that, I will also achieve the desires of my heart. And only one of these two is Queen of Heaven. <laughs> so, um, there is, you see, God is more ambitious for us than we are ambitious for ourselves. And that when Jose Maria started, could he have imagined Navarre University and all these other institutions worldwide? It's amazing. Um, every time, by the way, my first battle of the morning is to pray. 
And, um, but I always think that I've somewhere read the words of St. Jose Maria, that uh, I have to get, that even if I don't feel like it, even if I'm distracted, I must get into the chapel and pray, right? So I think, oh, okay. So, right? So he's helping me each day. It's one person's life. Amazing. What, there's no limit. Uh, yeah, over there. Microphone. Ways I can shout. Thank you. Um, I'm asking about um, if you have any problems with regards to faith, because, okay, in my country, we're about 42% Catholic and 38% Protestant. And I understand in England, you also have the Anglican Church, and then you also have the Catholic Church, and I think the Catholics are a minority. Um, I'm asking, when you talk about faith and reason and science, do you have problems with um, theological issues, or do you just go to the basics of God is good, I mean, God is one, God is three in one, and things like that, I mean, when you're um, trying to just, uh, what, what kind of problems are you thinking about? Have you got any examples of this? When you're explaining God in class, for example, okay. Yeah. And then you maybe you talk about Our Lady, or you want to talk about the angels, and you have mm. a few things that conflict. The, the I mean, in the Protestant Church, that they don't believe or they ah, love. Okay, right, right. Um, <coughs> thank you for that. Well, I mentioned about postmodernism in the academy. I think we've got postmodernism in society, of course, as well. So there's no. So although England is officially Anglican, that doesn't mean it has any much in the way of official Christian belief. So, um, in fact, it, it's, it's, um, uh, there is no, no unified belief project, you might say, for England anymore. It's one of the problems we have, because um, when people say, we must defend British values, no one knows what that means. Right? Um, so, um, I, I, wouldn't say there's, there's, I wouldn't say there's resistance from... Protestantism in the old sense. May I ask which country? Where do you come? What's your country? I'm a Uganda. Uganda. Okay. Okay. So, so perhaps the battle is more lively in Uganda. Yes. Um, in England, um, there's there's not much left of what you might call institutional Protestantism in a, in a in a strong way. Um, but I was saying earlier to uh, uh, to Father, um, the Catholic Church is not doing well, but everyone else has collapsed. So we're left, if you like, fairly isolated in some ways. Um, so when, so when, when the government wants to pass some legislation which is hostile to natural law, um, we, we're the target, you know, um, because we're, we're just quite prominent simply by being the only, the only group left, if you like. So um, what we have today, actually, a lot of Protestants looking to the Catholic Church, or some of them becoming Catholic, or at least helping us in various ways. Um, uh, um, against what, it's sometimes what can be a more aggressively secular state. But in England we have a funny relationship with the Catholic Church. It's a love-hate relationship. Because if you go back um, to the first thousand years of England, we were a Catholic country. And we are now like rebellious teenagers. So when teenagers love and hate their parents, um, that's the relationship. Um, so deep down, there's, there's also a love of the Catholic, there's a love of certain aspects of Catholicism, which we preserve in our countryside, our buildings, our music. Um, but it, it's, it's a funny mix, it's a funny mix of things. Thank you. Um, so, I'd like, well, yeah, Luis, Professor Montuenga. Thank you for for your talk and and your comments and uh, I think it's I would like to know your experience on uh, of the center and, and yourself uh, in the relationship with the with scientists at the university oh. and uh, especially uh, this idea of uh, visiting back the the old I mean the ancient or the past uh, wisdom. Mm -hmm which is, I think, is very important, mm -hmm. um, and also in terms of history of science, history of discoveries, the original questions that were uh, addressed. Um, uh, what's your, because when I review a, a paper, first thing I do is look at the references and see whether they are three or four years old, then I don't, I don't like uh, it. Yes. Um, so yes. this idea of, well, what they did in the past was very interesting, yes. and they, had very, they were wise, uh, even wiser, probably wiser than we are, 
uh, and they had good ideas. So, uh, and what's the, your, I yes. mean, the relationship in this in these terms with, with your colleagues there? Okay, uh, so there's several issues there. Um, first of all, I'd say that the relationship with scientists in Oxford is generally very good, particularly with the physical scientists. Um, so. Um, I mentioned the Oxford Forum for Science and Religion, but once a term, we have about 25 or 30 people gathered together just to talk about um, science and faith matters. And some of the, the, the top physicists in Oxford come to that meeting. Um, and they, uh, and it's, it's, it's fun, it's, an informal, it's a, a formal, an informal chance to discuss deep ideas. Um, some of our leading scientists in Oxford also publish popular books in science and faith issues. Um, uh, including you know, senior professors, so that's not unco it's not uncommon at Oxford. So for most of these um, most of these people have developed other areas of interest in life. So one of the um, one of the ways Oxford is perhaps a little bit different, in a good way, is um, that quite a lot of the senior people have picked up at least some knowledge of other things. So if they're physicists, maybe they've done a little bit of philosophy or done a little bit of theology or that they're interested in that, or a little bit of literature um, and so that there is there is some attempt to try to get ex wisdom in more than one discipline and that's partly facilitated by the university mixing people up all the time in colleges and faculties and so on um, it's still a problem though because to develop expertise in philosophy or theology takes many years and this is always the problem how do you become uh, how do you get deep wisdom in any field? You've got to study. And, and with the pressures of the modern academy, it's very difficult to do that. So I think what is good is to set up in, you know, some kind of inform, informal forum where you can have a chance to discuss and meet, um, exchange ideas. Sometimes it's good to ha hear a scientist explain a philosophical problem and then, and then, a, then a philosopher explain a scientific problem. And th that kind of cross-disciplinary work can, can, um, can be quite fruitful, strangely enough. With regard to the problem of being up to date, I know it's you, 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 we have to always be up to date the last few years. Sometimes if a neuroscientist says the same thing as Aristotle said 23 centuries ago, it's only believed because a neuroscientist has said it, not because Aristotle said it, uh, even though they may be saying the same thing in a particular area. Um, I, I don't have an easy answer to that, except uh, we've got to do both. <laughs> we've got to, but, but to have... But, even if one is doing very contemporary work, even that work will be much, will be improved or enhanced with an awareness of the past and teaching co other colleagues to have that awareness as well. Um, yeah, I'd like to, to say something because I was just struck by, in your presentation, how you explain that the faith shapes the world, the way you see the world. So I remember some weeks ago I was in a debate between a believer and an atheist and the, the atheist said something to the audience, so if you have faith you believe that there is an, an order, you can understand mm. that order, mm. but if you don't have faith that's, I mean, I only do science, I only make science, so I don't see any order at all. So when, when he was asked, so why do you science? So here's, I don't know. Um, could you comment on that? Because yes. uh, but you see, it's weird. That's right, but, but, we're, not de this point of view. That, but we're not dealing with, if you'd like, a tabula rasa. So even a scientist only doing science is inheriting a whole way of looking at the world shaped by 23 centuries of um, Greek philosophy and Roman law and Christianity and Judaism. Which and, and a kind of um, uh, as, a assumption of structure of order, um, which is not necessarily natural to human beings. There are cultures which don't have that. Um, so, so um, scientists, so an individual scientist may not have um, th that faith, and may not believe that faith is important, but um, he or she is still a beneficiary yeah. of a world of faith. Um, and even his or her university may be founded by someone with faith. So, so all these influences are there in the background, whether they know it or not. Um, yeah, that's... Yeah. Inter interestingly, um, 
If you look at who wins Nobel Prizes, I'm always fascinated by this. Who wins? Do you know which group of people win the most Nobel Prizes in proportion to their number? Well, the Jewish people. The Jewish people win around, I think it's nearly a third of all prizes in science and medicine. Only six million people. Um, Einstein was once said the Jewish people are not, fa are not special in any way. Well, he's Einstein. He's Jewish. <laughs> you know, so it's this extraordinary. Um, you see, but they've had a narrative. They've had a narrative for many, for a very long time, um, that God has a covenant with the world and God is um, knowable personally, albeit behind a veil. Right, and this shapes something has shaped their way of looking at the world so remarkably. So they're they're so fruitful uh, in in science and medicine. So culture matters. Some scientists, some and some, some religions um, or some cultures shaped by certain religions have produced very little in the way of um, new development. So culture matters. I think. So unfortunately, time is gone, and uh, so I would like to thank the speaker again for his yeah. talk. Hope to see you in the next CRIF seminar. So thank you for your presence. Thank you.